Hey guys, Patrick with Answers to the ACS. Tomato planes is a lie. Crazy, I know. Hopefully you didn't think this was all you needed to fly an airplane, even under day VFR, but in case you did, I'm here today to explain to you why it's not. You see, the regulation governing required equipment is not 91205. It's 91213, the regulation governing inoperative equipment. 91213 walks you through a multi-step process on what to do if equipment is not operative. This addresses PA, IB, K2, and S3 in a private pilot airplane ACS, and equivalent elements in a commercial pilot airplane ACS. The first step in this process is determining if the equipment is required. You have to check four sources of information and make sure it's not required. These are the KOEL or equipment list, certification regulations, CAR 3 Part 23, operational regulations, 91205, and airworthiness directives. The KOEL or equipment list is the first source to check because it's the easiest. Newer airplanes will have a kinds of operations equipment list, which is a lot like a minimum equipment list on bigger airplanes. Simply locate the inoperative item in the list and see if it's required for your operation. Day VFR, night VFR, day IFR, night IFR. Older Cessnas will have equipment lists that designate the equipment as required or not. However, if you're flying an older airplane that has no KOEL or equipment list like this, you'll have to go to the next source, the certification regulations. This is where a lot of people get lost since it's very complicated. I only understand how this works because I worked as an engineer at Cessna in a previous life. First, reference the type certificate data sheet for your airplane. Next, find the certification basis section. You'll see the regulations and amendment levels the airplane was certified to. CAR 3 for older airplanes and Part 23 for newer airplanes. You then have to locate these regulations and read through them. Obviously, it's not reasonable to expect this from a pilot, but the FAA disagrees. Back in 1987, a pilot found that the carburetor heat cable on his Cessna 150 was broken. He didn't believe it was required. It's not included in tomato planes. So he had his mechanic disable the carburetor heat cable and placard it inoperative. An FAA inspector later notes the placard and violated the pilot. It was taken to court and the pilot lost receiving a 30 day suspension on their certificate. It turns out that carburetor heat is required if the aircraft is so equipped by CAR 3606A and 23 1093A1. Guess what? There's a whole lot more that's required in CAR 3 and Part 23, which is not included in tomato planes. A fuel pressure gauge for pump-fed engines. This is why you see them on PA-28 series airplanes, but not Cessna 100 series airplanes that are carbureted. Similarly, a backup electric fuel pump. Again, this is why you see these on PA-28 series airplanes. A cylinder head temperature gauge for airplanes with adjustable cow flaps. This is why you see these on Cessna 182s, but not on older Cessna 172s. A stall warning indicator for airplanes that do not e exhibit an adequate aerodynamic warning of stall. This is why you see these on basically every airplane except a Piper Cub or a Ronca Champ. And the list goes on. To reiterate, if any of these items are inoperative, they must be repaired prior to flight. The third source is operational regulations. This is just a fancy term for the regulations that pilots operate under, in this case, part 91. This is where 91205 and tomato flames comes into play, but this is just a small part of the puzzle. Keep in mind there are other operational regulations in addition to 91205 that require equipment, such as 91205 requiring transponders and multiple regulations requiring communication radios. The last and fourth source is airworthiness directives. ADs rarely require equipment, but it happens sometimes. One example applies to airplanes with certain Lycoming TIA 540 engines. An AD requires a recurring inspection of the exhaust system due to possible carbon monoxide poisoning. The inspection interval may be increased if a carbon monoxide detector is in the airplane. As a result, if the increased inspection intervals are used, a, car a carbon monoxide detector must be installed and operative in the airplane. A second example applies to the Cessna 210. A slew of accidents in the 1980s prompted an AD which requires a second vacuum pump for IFR operations. Once you've verified each of these four sources, you will have determined whether or not the inoperative equipment is required. If it is required, you can't fly until it's fixed. If it's not required, you can then deactivate and placard it inoperative in accordance with 91213. Examiners shouldn't be asking applicants to regurgitate 91205 anymore. Instead, they will propose a scenario in which certain equipment is inoperative and ask what you would do. You would then go through the process I just discussed. In most cases, examiners will ask softball questions like, what would you do if your nav light was inoperative for a day VFR flight. However, they may want to see how much you know and ask what you would do if the stall warning or pitch trim are inoperative. Hint, those are required. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you learned something. If you did, hit that like button and subscribe so you can stay tuned for more videos. If you got a check ride coming up, download our app from the App Store where you can check out our manuals that address every element in the ACS like we did today. Till next time, fly safe.